So the interesting thing is that statins have two effects. So in the short term, I believe statins actually reduce the risk of cardiac events. And that was for my first lecture where we talked about how they actually inhibit the release of matrix metalloproteinases and they actually have anti-clotting mechanisms. So in the shorter term, if you take a statin on day one, it will actually reduce the risk of cardiac events irrespective of the LDL level. So we know it's got nothing to do with LDL lowering at all. And it doesn't take any time to come on. It happens basically as soon as you take the statin. The problem is that statins also have adverse consequences, which ultimately will, over time, continue to accumulate. And this, in my mind, is probably why long-term statin studies have never been performed. Most statin studies are one or two years. I think the longest that I've ever seen was seven years, and that was quite an outlier. And my feeling for this is that the risks of taking statins are likely to accumulate and increase over time, and it would only make sense if you wanted to build a case to sell statins that you would probably do your studies short enough so that you don't actually capture that increased risk. We certainly know that factors like coronary artery calcium score, it, it's well regarded that that's a very good measure of plaque instability and cardiovascular risk. And it's also accepted that statins increase coronary artery calcium. And it's funny, you watch people tie themselves in knots trying to explain this. We know statins are good, we know calcium's bad, Statins increase calcium, hang on, my head's going to explode. So they've come up with this term, paradoxical calcium. Now, why is it paradoxical? Well, it's paradoxical because we know it's bad, but it must be good because it comes from statins. It's just complete and utter lunacy to even think that. So in summary, the statins have an immediate benefit in reducing thrombotic risk and plaque stabilizing by inhibiting the release of the matrix metalloproteinases. But over time, the longer you take them, I believe the adverse effects are going to become magnified and accumulate. I wanted to ask, if people already have diabetes, do statins make the control and the um, issues with diabetes worse? Yes. I don't want to present biased information here, so for your information, I suggest you go to crestor.com. <laughs> Seriously. And in the top right of the screen, click on the prescribing information chart, and then uh, do a search through that, and you'll see that statins, it, because by law they have to put this information on their website, and you'll see that statins have been associated with increases in blood glucose, and they have vague wording, you know, that may exceed the threshold for diagnosis of diabetes. Basically, uh, crystal.com has information on their website confirming that not only do statins worsen diabetic control, but it actually causes diabetes in the first place. Interestingly, when we look at the data on uh, people's persistence with vegan style diets, that most people don't last more than four or five years. And I wonder whether some of that has to do with the liver only sustaining about four or five years B12 supply. Now, given that B12 is really the only nutrient that will absolutely kill you outright if you don't have it for long enough, it certainly makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that the liver actually has a particularly long store of B12 in it. Because obviously throughout human history, we're going to have had periods of famine and, you know, sometimes there are, you know, humans will have had to resort to plant foods to survive, not survive, not thrive, but just to survive, you know, and they'll be B12 deficient. So it makes sense that there is a, a longish store of that particular nutrient that will keep us alive, but more the particular genetics that would lead somebody to being more resilient to a B12 deficiency or iron deficiency, I don't know of. So first of all, it's an established principle that studies that have terminated early are well known to uh, bias results and lead to false outcomes. And there's been some very prominent studies on statins that have indeed finished early. So there was, there was one study which was the only study on primary prevention. It was supposedly a primary prevention study. Um, in actual fact, it wasn't, it included people um, who had secondary prevention features, sorry, yeah, secondary prevention features, and so it basically wasn't what it was saying. It 
was. And it also, at the start of the study, the investigators uh, laid down explicit criteria at which the study could be terminated early. And, and this is the way research is normally done, is to keep everything above board and transparent. So when the researchers got the first hint of results that might have been positive, they didn't want to risk those results um, turning away, so they ceased the study early in direct contradiction to their own criteria. And that's probably what you're referring to. Lumbrokinase and natokinase, these are actually basically clot breaking agents. They're designed to degrade the, uh, the clots themselves. And there are some actually, uh, I would call it preliminary or early research on these that is actually quite promising from a cardiovascular perspective. And I don't think the data is solid enough um, right now to be recommending it widely on a population basis. But it certainly fits very well with the mechanistic data that we have. And it's certainly very promising and there's nothing we've seen to suggest that it won't work. There's some uh, suggestive links. Now understand that this is not proof, but there's some suggestive links that glyphosate exposure may be associated with autism spectrum disorder. One thing we do know for certain though, is that gestational diabetes absolutely is associated. There's been, uh, at last count, there was uh, 17 associational studies, I think, that was a couple of years ago when I was looking at it, that showed some connection between gestational diabetes and autism. Now, I don't know if anybody's uh, done the randomised control trial. Good luck getting that one through ethics. Um, so, unfortunately, when I said that observational research does have a place in science, this is the place when it's just absolutely going to be impossible for us to actually do an experiment, and sometimes we just have to take the best research we've got. Um, but there is, uh, there's a very strong signal that would be suggesting uh, gestational diabetes to be a problem. And we know this because the baby's neuronal development as a fetus, it's, it's critically impacted by the mother's health. And if the mother's gestational diabetic, presumably extra oxidation stress and all these other things going on, it's only logical that that would adversely impact on the development of that child. Uh, occasionally, you see people posting on social media that they've had low vitamin C. Now, the only cases of low vitamin C that I've seen in clinic have been false. Vitamin C is very unstable as a blood test. When we take the blood, it needs to be popped on ice in a certain tube, and if it's not, it breaks down, and when it gets to the lab and they look for it, they can't find it. So every case of vitamin D deficiency that I've been presented with, I have corrected by highlighting on the blood test form, place sample on ice. Um, so that was an easy fix. Um, so vitamin C deficiency, I don't believe exists. I have actually come across what I do genuinely believe to be a case of copper deficiency in a carnivore. Now, if you actually uh, look uh, at the government websites, I was actually reading an article on this uh, yesterday. We do actually, with the nutrient depletion of soil, this does not just affect plant foods, it affects animals that are raised on those soils as well. And in large swathes of Australia, we know we have areas of copper deficiency. The same is tr also true for boron. So in the central tablelands of New South Wales with the very high rainfall, that tends to deplete the soil of boron. So I think it is plausible and I've certainly seen a case on somebody who I know was a diligent carnivore who appeared to have deficient copper levels. Now, that may have been some kind of genetic defect in the absorption of copper, or it could also have easily reflected the fact that they were diligent about only consuming meat from one particular farm. So I think across the population, if you're sort of getting your, your sources of food from different localities, that will reduce the risk of that. But we know that nutrient depletion in soil is a real problem, and presumably that will also transfer through the foods we eat. There's a power city of good quality randomised control trials supporting the vegan diet. When we actually have a look at all the data that's saying vegans are healthier, so on and so forth, they're all observational. A lot of the research comes out of Loma Linda, which is a Seventh Day University um, type uh, environment, where these people, while they, they're not vegan, by the way, the uh, 
Lona Linda research um, actually allows you to have a little bit of meat and still be considered vegan. Um, it's like when you're a little bit pregnant, I guess. <laughs> and um, so a lot of the research on vegans is going to be, uh, you know, needs that qualification. We also understand this healthy user bias. You know, these people, they're not drinking, they're not smoking, and they're probably leading cleaner lifestyles. The interesting thing is there is a similar population that we can compare vegans to. They're called the Mormons. The difference between them and the Seventh-day Adventists is that they eat meat. And in actual fact, the Mormons also, when we look at this observational data, which again doesn't prove anything, but the observational data shows that they appear to be as in equally good health as the Seventh-day Adventists. So it would seem that the, the meat doesn't really have a role there. But the, in its entirety, the data is simply lacking. There's certainly a decline in performance during the keto adaptation phase. So what most people assume, we, we conflate the rates of beta fatty acid oxidation with keto adaptation. So we, we do these measures and we say, well, you're burning fat at you know, two grams a minute, you know, you're, you're fully keto adapted. And that's not true. The ability to consume the energy resulting from that extra fat that you're burning requires uh, is another phase. So we have ketone transporters, MCT1 transporters, that take a while to upregulate. Speaking to Professor Grant Schofield, um, and he's got some uh, world-class triathletes under his, um, under his mentorship, and he's observed benefits prolonged up for eight, even 18 months after people go on those diets. I generally see that most of the benefits sort of peak out at about three or four months, but it's certainly longer than the two to six weeks that people commonly cite. And we've got very good evidence of that as well. So if we're producing ketones and our, uh, our cellular machinery to utilise those ketones has not been upregulated, then we'll basically wee those extra ketones out. And in doing so, this urinary excretion of ketones actually displaces the excretion of uric acid in the body. So we can actually see, as people adopt a ketogenic diet, that their urate levels will, in their blood will often go up, and that's because the ketones are displacing the excretion of urate. And then usually over a period of about two to three months, we see that the urate then will come back to normal. And that's at the point that I know that somebody is almost certainly fully keto adapted. Oh, absolutely. So there is absolutely a difference in the nutrient quality between grain-finished meat and grass-finished meat. So that includes DHA. So DHA, about 3% of the fats um, in beef can actually be DHA, which is pretty good. Um, vitamin K2, another nutrient essential for health, absent in plant foods, can be found in grass-finished meat. Vitamin D, so a very interesting story about vitamin D. So the feeding of uh, cattle in, uh, in lots was only really possible in the 1970s when they discovered the ability to inject vitamin D into cattle. Um, so when the process of photosynthesis, uh, cattle will be able to get some vitamin D presumably through the grass and their normal feed like that. But when you replace that with uh, grains, they're not getting that vitamin D. So the ability to have cattle being fed grains long term was only possible once we started injecting them with vitamin D3. So there are distinct nutritional deficiencies. And as I also presented, there's also the possibility that cattle being fed grains and crops are actually going to have a detectable glyphosate residue, which is obviously less optimal. From a general nutritional perspective, though, grain-fed meat is still a far better option for most people, and it's far more nutritionally dense. And you know, if you can only afford grain-fed meat, then there's no reason to avoid it. Um, and I would certainly, as long as you're making sure that you've got some awareness of the nutrients that are not present in the desired quantities in grain-finished meat, like the K2, like the DHA, making sure that you're, you know, maybe having some sardines occasionally, maybe making sure that you're having a bit of grass-fed meat occasionally, then you should be fine. <laughs>